A Critique of Interventionism by Ludwig von Mises Chapter 3 Social Liberalism Part 3 Liberalism and Social Liberalism Names are unimportant, what matters is substance. The term social liberalism sounds strange indeed as socialism and liberalism are mutually exclusive, but we are accustomed to such terminology. Also, socialism and democracy are irreconcilable in the final analysis, and yet there is the old concept of social democracy, which is a contradiction in ejecto. If today the Brentano school, which adopted syndicalism and some moderate edictists, designate their movement as social liberalism, no terminological objection need be raised. But we must object not for political reasons, but in the interest of scientific clarity and logical thought. This designation erases the differences between liberalism and socialism. It permits calling liberal that which is the very opposite of what history and social science define as liberal. The fact that in Great Britain, the home of liberalism, this semantic confusion prevails is no excuse for us to accede to the practice. Herner is correct when he observes that the sanctity of private property is not a dogmatically anchored objective for liberalism, but a means for the attainment of ultimate goals. He is mistaken, however, when he states that this is so only temporarily. In their highest and ultimate goal, liberalism and socialism are in agreement. They differ precisely that liberalism views private property in the means of production as the most suitable means to attain the goal, while socialism looks upon public property as the most suitable means. This difference in the two programs and this alone corresponds to the history and thought during the 19th century. Their different positions on the problem of property in production separates liberalism from socialism. It is confusing to present this in any other way. Socialism, according to Herner, is an economic system in which society organized in a state directly assumes responsibility for the existence of all its members, and the economic system based on satisfying the national needs rather than gleaning profits. The whole production and distribution process becomes the task of public authority, replacing private property in the means of production and their use for profit. This is not very precise, but is stated clearly enough. Herner then continues, if this system could be realized with liberal means, that is without force and violation of law, and if it could not only improve the material conditions of the people, but also assure a greater measure of individual freedom, then no objection could be raised against it from the liberal point of view. Thus, when Parliament discusses the question of nationalization, the Liberals, according to Herner, could vote for the common weal if it is introduced without force and violation of law, and if it were not for their doubts about the material well-being of the people. Herner seems to believe that the older liberalism advocated private property for its own sake and not for its social consequences. Like Wies and Zwiedenick, he construes a difference between the older and the contemporary liberalism. According to Herner, while the older liberalism viewed private property as an institution of natural law, whose protection besides that of individual freedom was the first duty of the state, contemporary liberalism is emphasizing ever more strongly the social factor in property. Private property is no longer defended with individualistic reasons, but with considerations of social and economic suitability. In a similar vein, Zwiedenek observes that there is reason for optimism, that a private property order for its own sake and in the interest of owners only would be of brief duration. Modern liberalism too is advocating private property on grounds of social suitability. It cannot be our task here to examine how non-liberal theories of natural law meant to defend private property as natural phenomenon, but it should be common knowledge that the older liberals were utilitarians. They are frequently criticized for it and that it was self-evident to them that no social institution and no ethical rule can be advocated for its own sake or for reasons of special interest, but can be defended only on grounds of social suitability. It is no indication that liberalism is moving towards socialism if modern liberalism demands private property in the means of production because of its social utility and not for its own sake or for the interests of owners. Private property and inheritance, Herner continues, give rise to unearned income. Liberalism sympathizes with the efforts of socialists to oppose this unearned income in the interest of justice and equal opportunity for all members of society.
The fact that unearned income flows from property is as obvious as that poverty comes from poverty. In fact, unearned income flows from control over the means of production. He who opposes unearned income must oppose private property in the means of production. Therefore, a liberal cannot sympathize with such efforts. If he does so, nevertheless, he is no longer a liberal. What in Herner view, then, is liberalism? His answer is this. Liberalism is a worldview, a kind of religion, a faith. It is a faith in the natural dignity and goodness of man, in his great density, in his ability to grow through his powers of natural reason and freedom, in the victory of justice and truth. Without freedom, there is no truth. Without truth, there can be no triumph in justice, no progress, thus no development, later stages of which are always more desirable than the preceding stages. What sunlight and oxygen mean to organic life, reason and freedom mean to intellectual development. Neither individuals, classes, nations, nor races must be viewed as mere means for the purpose of other individuals, classes, nations, or races. This is all very fine and noble, but unfortunately so general and vague that it equally applies to socialism, syndicalism, and anarchism. His definition of liberalism lacks a decisive ingredient, namely a social order that is built on private property in the means of production. It cannot surprise us that with such ignorance about liberalism, Herner also subscribes to practically all misconceptions that are in vogue today. Among others, in contrast to the older liberals, which aimed mainly at the elimination of hampering restrictions, modern liberalism, that is social liberalism, has a positive, constructive program. If Herner had discovered private property in the means of production as the basic ingredient of liberalism, he would have known that the liberal program is no less positive and constructive than any other. It is the mentality of officialdom, which, according to Brentano, was the only standing board of the Association for Social Policy, that considers as constructive and positive only that ideology which calls for the greatest number of offices and officials. And he who seeks to reduce the number of the state agents is decried as a negative thinker or an enemy of the state. Both Herner and Weiss expressly emphasize that liberalism has nothing to do with capitalism. Passau tried to show that the ambiguous terms capitalism, capitalistic economic order, etc., are political slogans that, with but few exceptions, are not used objectively to classify and comprehend the facts of economic life. Instead, they are used to criticize, accuse, and condemn phenomena that are more or less misunderstood. If this position is taken, it is clear that he who appreciates liberalism, no matter how he defines it, seeks to protect it from labels that are felt to be derogatory, defamatory, and abusive. However, if we agree with Passau's observation that for most writers who have given the term capitalism a definite meaning, its essence is the development and expansion of larger enterprises, we must admit that liberalism and capitalism are closely related. It was liberalism that created the ideological conditions that gave rise to the modern large-scale industrial production. If we should use the term capitalism to define an economic method that arranges economic activity according to capital calculation, we must come to the same conclusion. But no matter how we define capitalism, the development of capitalistic methods of production was and is possible only within the framework of a social order built on private property in the means of production. Therefore, we cannot agree with Weiss's contention that the essence of liberalism was obscured by its historical coincidence with large-scale capitalism. That which makes capitalism appear unliberal, according to Weiss, is its insensitivity towards suffering, the brutal use of elbows, and the struggle to overpower and enslave fellow men. This expression comes from the old register of socialistic complaints about the corruption and wickedness of capitalism. They reveal the socialistic misinterpretation of the nature and substance of the social order that is based on private property. If, in a capitalistic society, the buyer seeks to buy an economic good wherever it is the least expensive, without regard for other considerations, he does not act with insensitivity towards suffering. If the superior enterprise successfully competes with one working less economically, there is no brutal use of elbows or struggle to overpower and enslave fellow men. The process in this case is no undesirable concomitant effect or outgrowth of capitalism and unwanted by liberalism. On the contrary, the sharper the competition, the better it serves its social function to improve economic production. 
that the stagecoach driver was replaced by the railroad, the hand weaver by the mechanical weaving, the shoemaker by the shoe factory, did not happen contrary to the intentions of liberalism, and when small ship owners with sailing vessels were replaced by large steamship companies, when a few dozen butchers were replaced by a slaughterhouse, a few hundred merchants by a department store, it signifies no overpowering and enslaving of fellow men. Weiss remarks correctly that in reality, liberalism has never existed on a large scale, and that the community of liberals still needs to be created and brought along. Thus, the picture of what fully developed capitalism can achieve is incomplete at best. Even if we reflect upon British society at the zenith of capitalism when liberalism was leading the way, it is popular today to blame capitalism for anything that displeases. Indeed, who is still aware of what he would have to forego if there were no capitalism? When great dreams do not come true, capitalism is charged immediately. This may be a proper procedure for political parties, but in scientific discussion it should be avoided.